Hello and welcome to the course on literary theory and criticism. In today's class, we will be looking at psychoanalysis and psychoanalytic literary criticism. This is going to be a two part lecture. In the first part of the lecture, we will be looking at some key psychoanalytic concepts and the names of some key psychoanalytic theorists including Sigmund Freud and also his protege uh, Carl Gustav Jung. In the second part of the lecture, we will follow it up with a bit of Lacanian psychoanalytic theory. The lecture will also be complemented by a psychoanalytic reading of some prominent literary texts. So, to begin with, what is a psychoanalytic criticism? Put simply, it is a form of criticism which uses some of the techniques of a, of, of a method known as psychoanalysis in the interpretation of literature. Psychoanalysis itself is a form of therapy which sought to aim, uh, which sought to cure mental disorders by investigating the interaction between the conscious and the unconscious elements uh, in, in one's mind. Now, the classic method with which uh, by which this is achieved was to get the patient to talk freely in such a way that all his repressed feelings and emotions and desires and fears etcetera which are understood to be causing the conflicting problems are forced to come into the patient's own conscious mind and openly faced rather than remaining deeply buried within his own unconscious. To give you an example, the recent James Bond film Skyfall which was released in 2012 features uh, the use of one such method. Uh, if, you, if you are aware of the film, you will recall that James Bond is, uh, is seen to have gone through a very traumatic experience. He gets shot on the job and in order to, in order to enable him to come back to the job and start functioning as an agent again, he has to prove himself through a series of tests both physical as well as psychological. Now, one of the methods in which Bond is assessed psych psychologically is through a process known as uh, free association. That is a classic psychoanalytic method in which uh, the, the, the tester basically analyzes the character by throwing random words at him, words that are uh, intended to evoke a sort of emotional response. Now, from the film you will, know, you will recall that even though Bond has apparently no issues in responding fast and accurately to some of the words that are thrown at him, words such as gun or car for instance, he has an immediate problem when he is confronted with the word skyfall. Now, that is because of Bond's own uh, close association with uh, the place called as skyfall which used to be his parental home. Now, clearly as you can see from this example, the hesitance that Bond encountered while trying to uh, cope with the stimulus word skyfall. To shel to shows us that he has a clear problem in associating himself with this uh, stimulus known as skyfall. Now, this process itself is based on specifically the practices of how uh, the mind and the instincts and specifically and most importantly how perhaps sexuality works. Now, these theories were developed by an Austrian psychologist and doctor known as Dr. Sigmund Freud. Now, these theories and methods were developed by the Austrian psychologist Dr. Sigmund Freud who lived between 1856 and 1939. Now, there is a growing consensus among theoreticians and scholars today that all the, 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 the therapeutic values of the methods advocated by Dr. Sigmund Freud might be somewhat limited and that Freud's own life work is perhaps seriously flawed by a lot of uh, methodological irregularities. At the same time, we cannot deny the fact that Sigmund Freud remains a major cultural force and has made massive contributions to the way we think about ourselves. Now, all of Dr. Freud's uh, work depends upon the notion of the unconscious which is like I mentioned earlier, the part of the mind that goes beyond the consciousness and which nevertheless has a very strong influence on our day to day actions. Many of Freud's own ideas concern aspects of sexuality and is perhaps one of the reasons why Freudian psychology is kind of often marred in controversy. Notorious among his theories perhaps is his theories on infantile sexuality which uh, is basically the notion that sexuality begins not at puberty or at physical sexual maturation, but even way before that you know especially through the infants, the male infants relationship to his mother. And connected with this idea is of course, the idea of the Oedipus complex as you can see here written on the blackboard. Oedipus complex is basically uh, a theory by uh, Sigmund Freud which, which says that the male infant conceives a desire to eliminate the father and become the sexual partner of the mother. 
Many forms of intergenerational conflict are seen perhaps uh, by Freudians as having a bearing on uh, having Oedipal overtones. For example, professional rivalries between a generation of men and perhaps uh, the preceding generation of men can be explained using this framework. Harold Bloom's book, The Anxiety of Influence, which was published in 1973, also sees the struggle for identity by each generation of poets as an enactment of this very same Oedipus complex. Now, as you can imagine, the very idea of Oedipus complex would suggest perhaps that Freudian theory is often deeply masculinist in bias and that is also one of the reasons why Freudian classic Freudian theory was often attacked by uh, feminist critics and thinkers. Another key Freudian idea is that of the libido which is basically uh, which can be understood as the energy drive associated with sexual desire. Now, in classic Freudian theory, it has three major stages of focus including uh, the oral, the anal and the phallic. Now, these are in turn derived from the five psychosexual stages of development that Freud had originally proposed. The libido in the individual is a part of uh, a more generalized drive which Freud would later call eros. As you can see from the blackboard, eros is derived from uh, the Greek word uh, for love and which basically implies the life force and it is complemented by what we have here as thanatos which is derived from the Greek word for death and basically implies the death instinct. Repression is also a key Freudian terminology that you need to be familiar with when you understand uh, psychoanalytic literary criticism. Repression implies the forgetting or the, or, or, or the repression of um, ig or, the, or the ignoring of unresolved conflicts, unadmitted desires or traumatic past events so that they are in a, in a way forced out of your unconscious, uh, forced out of your conscious awareness into the realm of the unconscious. This is a psychological defense mechanism which is uh, in intended to guard the psyche from un 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 unnecessary trauma. The underlying assumption in psychoanalysis is that when some deep rooted wish, a fear or a memory or a desire is too difficult to face, we may try to cope with it by repressing it or eliminating it from our conscious into the unconscious. However, what needs to be acknowledged is that this does not necessarily make uh, this, this unwanted feeling go away. It still remains alive within the unconscious and constantly sees a way back into the conscious mind, always succeeding eventually. At this point, perhaps uh, I, I would like to draw your attention to a film starring Christian Bale that came out a few years ago known as The Mentalist, sorry The Machinist. Now, in, 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 the, in the Machinist, we have the character of Christian Bale who is uh, surprisingly unable to sleep. He is an insomniac, he is completely unable to achieve sleep and we see that he is a character who is deeply troubled and keeps on losing weight as the film progresses. Now, he does not know why this is happening except that there is this deep rooted unsettled uh, feeling that governs him. It is only towards the end of the film that we realize that he was involved in a, in a hit and run accident and he did not actually bother covering up I mean you know taking care of his victim there. So, the fact that he did something that was unacceptable to him in his normal life compelled him to have all sorts of traumatic experiences and he basically repressed this memory of having hit over someone and you know just bailed on the scene. And this is perhaps the reason why he is seen as a tr completely troubled and traumatic individual throughout the film. It is only when he is confronted he feels he, he confronts his the, 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 the true reason for his insomnia that he is finally able to achieve sleep. This is a classic case of Freudian repression where a, where, a, where a traumatic memory is forced out of your conscious mind into the unconscious, but it nevertheless exerts a very strong kind of an influence on your day to day life. Another key Freudian mechanism is that of uh, projection. This is a process when we usually use uh, negative aspects of ourselves and we do not we do not really recognize it as belonging to us. Thus, our own dark desires are in a way disowned and uh, expelled from uh, our, our, our own self. For example, to give you an example, uh, a student who conspicuously feels that everybody in his class is, is, is intent on copying in on an exam would perhaps be exercising a form of projection himself. He is unable to admit that he has tendencies to copy during the exams and this results in him projecting all these negative uh, uh, feelings 
on to his friends and the people that surrounds him. So, in effect when he is being paranoid about his fellow students copying and cheating on an exam, a Freudian psychoanalyst would perhaps argue that this is because he has an innate tendency and a deep rooted desire to cheat in this very exam. Later in his career, Freud would suggest a three part model of the psyche dividing it into the ego, the superego and the id. As you can see on the board here, this is the basic three model part of the uh, psyche or the personality and the id is a force that roughly corresponds to the unconscious while the ego corresponds to the conscious and the superego corresponds to the uh, conscience itself. Now, the id is a primitive life force and it is governed by uh, what you would call the pressure principle. The id does not really care about you know the consequences of actions. For example, if a person were to be completely consumed by the powers of the id, if he were feeling hungry, he would perhaps look for the closest source of nutrition. He would not really care about whether this food is ac accessible to him, whether taking this food or consuming it would violate in some way some other codes that est that govern established uh, norms of behavior. For example, he would not think twice before, with before considering whether this food is something that is not accessible to him because he does not have the money to pay for it. He would just be interested in, uh, in, in, in satiating his own feelings. That is why it is it's, it's related to the unconscious. The ego on the other hand is governed by what we know as the reality principle. So, for example, even if a person is feeling extremely hungry, he might be forced to look at uh, alternative, uh, uh, alternative circumstances too. For example, he might think about whether he has the money to buy this or not or whether he is in a position to safely steal the food or not. The superego on the other hand corresponds to the conscience which, which again uh, is derived from all your moral codes and your spirituality and religion and law and order and things like that. For example, a person who is completely driven by a superego would rather choose to starve himself to death rather than steal a morsel of food. You can see how these three levels often uh, overlap as you can see from the diagram. Now, a final example of important Freudian terminology is perhaps that of the dream work, which is to say the process by which real events or desires are transformed into concrete uh, dream images. Now, this can include processes such as displacement whereby one person or an event is represented by another in some form of uh, through some form of uh, symbolic substitution. It is also complemented by a process known as condensation whereby a number of people events or meanings are combined and represented by a single image in the dream. We will come back into this uh, uh, for, uh, we will come back to these terms uh, in greater detail when we discuss uh, Jacques Lacan. Thus, we understand that characters, motivation or events are represented in dreams in a very literary sort of a way involving its translation by the dream work of abstract ideas or feelings into concrete images. For example, an abstract idea like fear or love can find a concrete expression in a very literary way in a person's dream and this is why literary studies is interested in psychoanalytic models of criticism. Dreams then just like literature do not make explicit statements, they both tend to communicate obliquely or indirectly avoiding direct or open statement representing meanings through concrete embodiments of time, space or action. Freudian interpretation is popularly thought to be a matter of attributing sexual connotations to objects, so that everyday objects like towers or ladders for instance are seen as uh, phallic symbols. Now, you can see immediately how this might be slightly problematic and is one of the reasons why psychoanalytic Freudian psychoanalytic criticism is uh, open to uh, great vehemently uh, great and vehement criticism. For instance, uh, 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 the metaphor of a snake would perhaps be a very strong phallic uh, connotation for uh, somebody who is interested in Freud, but you can see clearly how uh, for instance a Victorian woman who sees uh, the image of a snake might have completely different connotations from that of say an Indian woman a very religious Indian, Indian woman who is perhaps used to I, used to the idea of worshipping a state uh, worshipping a snake as a religious deity. Thus Freudian terms and ideas were dealt with criticism openly in Freud's own lifetime. Uh, this has often led to a joke in, in, in uh, joke in itself because as you can clearly uh, you might have seen pictures of Sigmund Freud and in most uh, most often 
Sigmund Freud is usually seen uh, you know holding on to a cigar or smoking a cigar. Now the phallic connotations of smoking a cigar is was, uh, was a matter of great mirth and fun to some of Freud's own critics which even prompted him to openly declare in anger that sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. However, jokes apart, Freudian interpretation is often highly ingenious rather than highly simplistic as we shall soon see in the case of some Freudian examples. Freud believed that a dream was an escape hatch or a safety valve through which all our repressed fears and desires or memories seek an outlet into the conscious mind. The emotion in question would be censored by the conscious mind and, and thus has to en enter the dream in a disguise so to speak. Now like I said earlier condensation is one of the processes by which this is achieved. Condensation refers to the dream's tendency to combine several themes into one dream symbol. For example, in dreams multiple dream thoughts are often combined and amalgamated into a single element of the manifest dream. To give you an example, even if you keep your uh, work life and your personal life strictly separate, you might not be surprised to, to find that characters from your workplace often meld into characters from your own personal life in a dream. Thus, people and places are often seen melding into composite figures in dreams. This is exactly what the process known as condensation implies. To give you another example, imagine the case of a young man who is who lives under the authoritarian uh, thumb of his powerful and dominating father. Now imagine also that he is, he is in love with a young French girl, the alliance which the father which his father would vehemently and strongly op oppose. Now, Sigmund Freud would not be too surprised if this man, if this young man had recurrent dreams of a young policewoman. How does this happen? Here in the dream, both the father and the French policeman are associated with ideas of strictness, authority and power and coupled with the fact that he is in love with a French girl that the father disapproves of, he has recurrent images of a French policeman which is basically his dream symbols that are condensed into one. Here, both the feared father and the desired lover are condensed into the single dream figure of the French police woman. Freudian interpretation thus, as you can see, has always been of considerable interest to literary critics. The basic reason here again is that the unconscious, like the poem or the novel or the play, cannot speak directly or explicitly but does so through images, symbols, emblems and metaphors. Likewise, literature too is not involved with making direct or explicit statements about life but it is more concerned with showing and expressing experience through images, symbols, metaphors and so on. However, because the statements made here are not explicit, there is an inevitable element of judgment that is involved and consequently psychoanalytic interpretations of literature are often controversial. Now this can be very well illustrated by the example of the snake metaphor that we discussed earlier. Now, a discussion of Freud and his psychoanalytic theories also warrants a brief note on archetypal criticism which was in this context significantly developed by his protege uh, uh, Carl Gustav Jung who worked together with Freud for many years before parting ways and developing radically different theories. The theories of uh, Carl Gustav Jung which we know today as archetypal criticism will be taken up in the next module. Thank you. Thank you.